Okay. Uh, so you should have gotten two things. Uh, one is a handout that you can also find on the website. Uh, and the other one is just a picture uh, that isn't on the that isn't on the website um, uh, yet. So <clears throat> my uh, plan for this time is in six pieces. So first, I want to talk about um, sort of what's behind that picture uh, in philosophy in the mirror of nature. Rorty was concerned principally with the Enlightenment. Uh, Enlightenment epistemology and its legacy. Uh, but now he's concerned in, in the things we're reading for this week with Romanticism and its legacy. So uh, I want to talk about his, uh, his views there. Uh, second, uh, his, his occasion for this piece on 19th century idealism and 20th century textualism the two, two versions of romanticism that he's uh, discussing there as he understands them is this uh, outrageous claim of Derrida's uh, that there is nothing outside the text. All there is is text. That's the quintessential doctrine of what he's calling tech 20th century textualism. So I want to say something about that. Um, what, what's behind it and uh, what's wrong with it. Uh, third, I want to talk about uh, the notion of vocabulary dependence that uh, is uh, at the center of the philosophical lessons that Rorty wants to learn from his discussion of romanticism. Uh, and for the fourth point, I want to talk about um, the extent to which pragmatists can make, like Rorty, can make sense of the notion of conceptual progress of some vocabularies being better than others uh, in a way that isn't simply a matter of preference, uh, even though uh, it also isn't a matter of being closer to nature's own vocabulary or uh, even accurately representing the way things are. And then uh, for the last two, uh, thinking this is for after the break, uh, I want to unpack uh, an argument that I see implicit in this discussion of Rorty's. Uh, he makes all the points that, that I'll consider. Uh, this is uh, what you'll find on the very last page of the long handout after the quotes. Uh, he makes these uh, five claims at various points. He doesn't assemble them into an argument, but I think uh, implicitly he thinks there's an argument there. And I want to consider uh, uh, what the virtues and vices of that uh, argument might be. Uh, and then finally, want to consider what the prospects are of um, making sense in pragmatist terms of normative and not merely causal constraint by how things are understood in some sort of vocabulary independent way. Uh, and this is just a, a gesture towards the sorts of issues that uh, we'll worry about in the next couple of weeks and that will eventually take us into the expressivist uh, version of anti-representationalism. So we can start off looking at this, uh, at this picture. Uh, the overall view, Rorty wants to give us uh, a very capacious notion of romanticism uh, he thinks there's two broad species of it, uh, the idealist species and the pragmatist species. Uh, and textualism, he thinks, is another form uh, of romanticism, and that it, it Derrida being the um, 
principal textualist, but he's talking about all of the uh, literary fans of what they call theory with a capital T uh, that came to flourish in the 80s and are still with us at least in some form. Uh, and he distinguishes between weak and strong textualists uh, and lines up the weak textualists with the idealists and the strong textualists with the pragmatists. Uh, this is uh, the essays we read for this week correspond to Rorty's leaving the Princeton philosophy department and going to the uh, comp lit department at Virginia. Uh, he won the uh, MacArthur Young Genius Prize and was uh, given, so, so got a lot of money and uh, bought a big, uh, a big house in uh, Charlottesville, but moved disciplines, moved from what was then the premier uh, philosophy department in the world to a lit department to, to be a romantic um, and aligned himself at least for a while with what he called the strong textualists. In this picture, uh, the left-hand side, the idealists and the weak textualists uh, are the ones who haven't freed themselves yet uh, from uh, philosophy, from uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, from some sort of um, privileging of vocabularies, whereas the the true romantics, the pragmatists that he's seeing as um, informing strong textualists, that's the, the non-philosophical, the post-metaphysical, post-realist, post-representationalist uh, strand. Uh, I thought I'd start off by saying something about um, the framework that Rorty's thinking about this uh, in, uh, which I think we can usefully think about in terms of a distinction between intellectuals and researchers. Uh, intellectuals, this is a, a distinction that Rorty regiments elsewhere. Intellectuals, he thinks, are people who worry about how all the different parts of the culture hang together and how we got to where we are, to the, to the cultural uh, situation that we're in, uh, particularly the high culture, uh, academics, uh, writers of uh, other kinds, people are concerned with understanding uh, the culture, but uh, really interested in the culture as a whole. Researchers, and this corresponds to uh, academic departments, uh, not uh, by accident, are specialists in uh, a field or a discipline. I talked last time a little bit about uh, the difference between those ways of conceiving them. Uh, in German academic prose, there's a useful term that Rorty often uses, uh, Fach. Uh, which really just means box. What box are you in? But uh, in uh, academic prose is asking, well, what is your specialty? What, what is it that you um, do research in? Uh, and when uh, following Rorty, we say that the idealists and the weak textualists are the philosophical romantics, whereas the pragmatists and the strong textualists are non-philosophical uh, romantics. It's a picture of philosophy as a kind of research that gives you a particular uh, insight as an intellectual, so that uh, the thought, and this is certainly Kant's thought, uh, is that uh, philosophy is a research area, uh, a discipline, a fach, such that uh, by doing research in that area, 
you get a special firmer grip on uh, a leg up on uh, a special insight in being an intellectual, in understanding uh, the culture at large. Kant thought that because philosophy was centered around the theory of knowledge and he thought of the high culture as aiming at knowledge. We were the specialists in uh, the structure of knowing, which was what everybody was uh, trying to do. That's the picture of philosophy that, that Rorty rejects in Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. Uh, but he sees successor, uh, successor notions of that. And I think before we get into the details of the Romanticism, uh, it's uh, useful to think about the way in which Rorty is an intellectual uh, here. And here, if you look at the uh, quotes uh, from the handout, which, uh, I mean, you may feel I've vandalized them by um, uh, highlighting them in the way uh, I did. There's certainly a diminishing returns that sets in when you uh, are highlighting to the extent that I do there. Uh, but uh, I wanted it to be easier to take in some of the main, uh, some of the main claims. Uh, but uh, on page 166 of uh, that textualism essay, uh, he says, the strong textualist may brush aside the notion of a text as machine, which operates quite independently of its creator. That's his picture of what the weak textualist does and offer what Bloom calls a strong misreading. Uh, this is from Harold Bloom's map of misreading. The critic asks neither the author nor the text about their intentions, but simply beats the text into a shape which will serve his own purpose. He makes the text refer to whatever is relevant to that purpose. And he does this by imposing a vocabulary, a grid in Foucault's terminology on the text, which may have nothing to do with any vocabulary used in the text or by its author. And then he sees what happens. The model here is not the curious collector of clever gadgets, taking them apart to see what makes them work and carefully ignoring any extrinsic end they may have. This is weak textualism coming out of the new criticism. Uh, but the model is rather the psychoanalyst blithely interpreting a dream or a joke as a symptom of homicidal mania. Uh, this, I think, is uh, Rorty's practice. Uh, you know, it's a description of how he uh, approaches texts. But uh, as an intellectual, the text that he works on more than anything else is the history of philosophy. Um, uh, in this discussion of Romanticism, we see that uh, he's uh, spreading his target areas somewhat and literature is brought in as well. And he's worried about uh, our understanding of the place of natural science uh, in uh, the culture. But he's, he's addressing all of this as a text that he's going to impose a vocabulary, a grid on uh, for his purposes. I thought here of uh, a passage from the historian Kevin Baker, who says, uh, talking about being an intellectual historian, uh, not content to simply be mad at the present, the historian goes to the archives, an endless repository of old things to be mad about, and then assembles these maddening things into new diachronic objects, all of which afford opportunities for being mad and being driven mad. That's his uh, um, picture of what, uh, Baker's picture of what he's doing as an intellectual historian. Um, and I think Rorty is giving us examples of that. Uh, and before we get into the details, one of the, uh, my favorite compressed versions of Rorty doing this is in the second essay uh, that you have quotes from. It's from uh, 179 in the 
solidarity and objectivity essay. You can see this on your uh, handout. Uh, he says, that's why I think we, we need to say, despite Putnam, that there is only the dialogue, only us, and to throw out the last residues of the notion of transcultural rationality. But this should not lead us to repudiate, as Nietzsche sometimes did, the elements in our movable host, which embody the ideas of Socratic conversation, Christian fellowship, and enlightenment science. Nietzsche ran together his diagnosis of philosophical realism, here in this essay where he's using the term realism to address what he calls representationalism uh, elsewhere, his diagnosis of philosophical realism, representationalism, as an expression of fear and resentment, that's something uh, Rorty thinks Nietzsche is just right about. But he's saying Nietzsche ran that together with his own resentful idiosyncratic idealizations of silence, solitude, and violence. So Rorty wants to distinguish these two strands in Nietzsche. Post-Nietzschean thinkers like Adorno and Heidegger and Foucault have run together Nietzsche's criticisms of the metaphysical tradition on the one hand, with his criticisms of bourgeois civility, Christian love, and the 19th century's hope that science would make the world a better place to live on the other. Uh, Rody doesn't want to go along with Nietzsche in this second regard. I don't think there's any interesting connection between these two sets of criticisms, he says. Pragmatism seems to me, as I've said, he thinks of Nietzsche as a pragmatist, uh, a philosophy of solidarity rather than despair. From this point of view, Socrates' turn away from the gods, Christianity's turn from an omnipotent creator to the man who suffered on the cross, and the Baconian turn from science as contemplation of eternal truth to science as an instrument of social progress can be seen as so many preparations for an act of social faith that's suggested by a Nietzschean view of truth. Now, here in one passage, uh, Rorty has given us, I think, a deep and insightful way of dividing Nietzsche into uh, an insightful philosopher on the one hand, whose uh, basic thought is uh, a pragmatist criticism of representationalist uh, and realist metaphysics, uh, wants to separate that from his uh, criticism of uh, Socrates, of Christianity, and of uh, natural science. Uh, in the uh, Enlightenment uh, picture of them, well adapted toward the end of uh, uh, social solidarity that uh, Rorty is preaching here. Uh, as far as I know, Rorty never wrote uh, uh, an extended interpretation of Nietzsche. Uh, he did sometimes teach the course when his colleague Walter Kaufman uh, was on sabbatical, and Alexander Nahamas, the uh, most insightful contemporary uh, Nietzsche reader that we have, uh, was a student of Rorty's uh, at Princeton, but he himself never wrote about uh, never wrote about this, but I think here in a paragraph, he's put the uh, sort of topic sentence of uh, a reading of Nietzsche that belongs in a box with uh, uh, Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche on the one hand and Derrida's reading of Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche uh, on the other. Anyway, this is his uh, imposition of a grid on uh, uh, Nietzsche and his uh, admirers that is an example of the kind of uh, imposition of a vocabulary for an intellectual's purpose to, to make something uh, visible for us that, uh, that otherwise wouldn't be. Uh, so I, I wanted to uh, I didn't want to let that passage uh, go by. It's, um, uh, I think, a masterful instance of uh, its kind. 
Okay. Uh, it's in something of that spirit that Rorty mm, gives us a reading of what romanticism is all about. Uh, and it's, I think, uh, though a recognizable picture, it's an idiosyncratic picture. Uh, it's uh, a way of finding antecedents for the pragmatism that he wants uh, to develop. Uh, we'll see uh, in, we'll see next week as we start to read the uh, Girona lectures that he continues uh, with this romanticism trope uh, as one of the lectures is called uh, pragmatism is romantic polytheism. Uh, so, so this is something that uh, stays with him. Uh, I think uh, one epitome of how he's thinking about uh, romanticism is this passage from 164 in the textualism essay. Uh, Hegel left Kant's ideal of philosophy as science a shambles, but he did create a new literary genre, a genre, a genre which exhibited the relativity of significance to choice of vocabulary, the bewildering variety of vocabularies from which we can choose and the intrinsic instability of each. Uh, that's a romantic achievement and why he's thinking of romanticism as coming to full flower in, uh, uh, in Hegel. Now, I said this was uh, uh, idiosyncratic on uh, his part. N normally, I think we think about uh, Hegel's idealism as synthesizing Enlightenment rationalism and uh, literary romanticism uh, and so sort of being Janus faced. Uh, there is a uh, passage like that. Uh, Yeah, on 162 in that essay, um, one side of transcendental idealism is turned toward Newton, Locke, the way of ideas and the problem of perception. The other faces toward Schiller, Hegel, and Romanticism. That's the, um, the picture he's uh, working with. Uh, I see in reading these, uh, two essays, the uh, textualism essay and the solidarity and objectivity uh, essay, uh, which are from essentially the same, the same time in the early 80s, uh, uh, a number of different claims that uh, Rorty isn't really sorting out uh, for us. Uh, one early on, is the idea that all, this is from 155, uh, the claim that all problems, topics, and distinctions are language relative. The result of our having chosen to use a certain vocabulary to play a certain language game. Um, second is, uh, and this, there's a, passage from 168 in that first essay, uh, that there's a whole class of ideas that presuppose a privileged vocabulary, the vocabulary which gets to the essence of the object, the one which expresses the properties which it has in itself, as opposed to those which can be read into it. Uh, and he's approving Nietzsche and James said that the notion of such a vocabulary was a myth, that even in science, not to mention philosophy, we just cast around for a vocabulary to let us get what we want. Uh, now that last formula is typically 
uh, a, a typical uh, sort of offhand throwaway uh, from Rorty, but uh, the second idea is to criticize uh, any philosophical view that presupposes the notion of an objectively privileged vocabulary. Uh, that is one that uh, is made better than other vocabularies simply by its relation to its subject matter. Uh, as opposed to uh, its being better, being itself a vocabulary relative uh, notion relative to the vocabulary that we're uh, assessing it in. And in particular, he comes down hard in uh, this essay, and I would say this is the third uh, strand of thought, that the vocabulary of science is merely one among others, merely the vocabulary which happens to be handy in predicting and controlling nature. It is not, as physicalism would have us think, nature's own vocabulary. Uh, or he says again, that that's from 155. Uh, he says again, the current scientific vocabulary is one vocabulary among others. And there's no need to give it primacy, nor to reduce other vocabularies to it. Uh, and he says on 162, uh, Hegel began treating the vocabulary of Galilean science as simply one among dozens of others in which the idea chose to describe itself. So this third idea is uh, and, and what he likes about uh, romanticism and uh, in particular the strong textualist version of it is uh, to put science in its place as merely another literary genre, uh, another offering vocabularies that have some practical advantages. He says, uh, happen to be handy in predicting and controlling nature, well, that's their particular advantage. It's not that languages of natural science, that it's just a coincidence that they're good at predicting and controlling nature, um, I think uh, the view is. But that that's one thing that you could see as an advantage of uh, a vocabulary, uh, and that that purpose isn't itself privileged relative to other purposes that people that people might adopt. So this uh, third claim is a, a sort of leveling out uh, of uh, a claim that scientific philosophy would give to nature, uh, sorry, to science, uh, having a distinctive kind of privilege. Um, and then the fourth claim is uh, the one he uses actually to define romanticism. So this comes up both at the beginning of the essay and then here, and I'll cite the passage from uh, 163, uh, romanticism is defined as the thesis that the one needful thing was to discover not which propositions are true, but which vocabulary we should use. So uh, I see all this as downstream from the vocabulary vocabulary. Uh, uh, from that Quinean criticism of Carnap, uh, and it's uh, romanticism displacing the question, uh, the representationalist question, uh, what is it for one vocabulary more accurately to represent the way things objectively are 
uh, with a more general question, uh, well, what, what vocabularies are good for what? Uh, what should we, what vocabulary should we adopt now? Uh, and with the thought that uh, many vocabularies are available and this, uh, again, Hegelian theme that uh, we transform ourselves by adopting new vocabularies, uh, that there's a distinctive way of um, uh, a distinctive kind of self-transformation that consists in uh, redescribing things and so becoming a new kind of uh, being by adopting a new vocabulary. Now, I think all of this is uh, hugely problematic in uh, many ways, in particular, the question of just uh, how he's thinking about putting science in its place, uh, demoting it to uh, just another vocabulary, just another um, literary uh, genre. Uh, but uh, this is the general uh, uh, picture, I say, in these uh, four strands of thought. Uh, lots of things are uh, vocabulary relative. Uh, there's something problematic about uh, the idea of objectively privileged vocabularies, uh, vocabularies that are privileged because of their subject matter, because of the world that they represent, uh, and that on the basis of that, uh, uh, of that insight, uh, we should reject privileging the vocabulary of natural science in certain ways. Uh, and then finally, the idea that uh, there's a distinctive kind of self-transformation that consists in adopting a new vocabulary. Uh, and that that's really what's important about human life is that kind of uh, self-transformation by redescribing oneself and one's world, adopting a new vocabulary, and that uh, what was progressive, as he sees it, about uh, Romanticism in its idealist form, but much more so in its uh, pragmatist form, is uh, its focus on that self-transformative capacity of adopting new vocabularies as sort of the center of human uh, aspiration rather than the aspiration to get things right uh, representationally. Uh, okay, so I, I wanna say something more about these, uh, uh, about these issues, but maybe I'll uh, pause there to invite comments. How outrageous is this? Um, I mean, this, this is Rorty in full voice and vigor. Uh, you know, the, these essays are perfect examples of uh, what made everybody so angry uh, uh, about him. The, the second of these essays, the Solidarity and Objectivity was his Howison lecture, uh, which uh, I think he gave this one, uh, that's at Berkeley, uh, that's their big uh, university-wide lecture. So it, it's not aimed just at philosophers, but at, at the whole uh, faculty. And if you'd like comparisons, though he did his Howison lecture in 83, uh, since they started, and that was before Berkeley started um, videotaping them, video recording them, but since then you can see John McDowell's uh, Howison lecture. Uh, if you go to the, uh, to the Berkeley uh, website, or I think it's on uh, 
YouTube as well. And you can see my, I think McDowell's is from nine. Uh, you can see mine from 13. Uh, this was Rorty's um, Howison lecture. So he's not only speaking to literary people, but to uh, scientists uh, in the audience in the second, um, in the second lecture. But are there responses? Uh, I have like a question. Answer? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, sorry, the face of idealism, transcendental idealism that's turned more towards Schiller, um, sorry, uh, Hegel and um, yeah, Schiller are, is that something that he's okay with? Uh, the, the Rorty's okay with. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and, I mean, and the, label it a transcendental idealism. That yeah. he he thinks what was progressive about uh, Kant, and that was picked up uh, uh, by Hegel, is this romanticism. Mm -hmm. uh, what he repudiates of Kant and transcendental idealism in philosophy in the mirror of nature is precisely its putting philosophy of science as first philosophy. Uh, it's uh, adoption of the enlightenment, of enlightenment philosophy's epistemological uh, paradigm uh, and sees rather it's opening up, uh, uh, it, it's opening up of the possibility of thinking about vocabularies in the way he sees Hegel doing uh, and so making contact with the romantic valorization of art and literature rather than natural science. That's what Rorty's all in favor of. Thank you. I mean, oh. Uh, it's as far as the, the valorization of science is concerned, it's a little hard to tell exactly what sort of uh, privilege he thinks uh, science as a compartment of the high culture has that it shouldn't have, or is it true? Uh, on the handout is meant to indicate some of those uh, uh, different things that he says just on this theme. So, you know, textualism wants to place literature at the center and treat both science and philosophy as at best other literary genres. Uh, and idealism, idealism and textualism have in common an opposition of the claim of science to be a paradigm of human activity. Uh, and again, 165, the principal legacy of metaphysical idealism is the ability of the literary culture to stand apart from science, to assert its spiritual superiority to science, to claim to embody what's most important for human beings. Uh, the romanticism which Hegel brought to philosophy reinforced the hope that literature might be the successor subject to philosophy, that what the philosophers had been seeking, the inmost secrets of the spirit, were to be discovered by the new literary genres which were emerging. And again, uh, there was a third step in the process of establishing the autonomy and supremacy of the literary culture. The notion that philosophy might replace science as a secular substitute for religion was a momentary though important stage in the replacement of science by literature as the presiding cultural discipline. So he has this notion of a presiding cultural discipline, a paradigm of human activity, uh, this, which has spiritual superiority, uh, sort of telling us more about uh, who we are. And I think, <clears throat> so, I mean, this is sort of a grab bag of uh, conceptions, uh, but he definitely sees 
the Enlightenment as <clears throat> assigning science the, this role of being uh, <clears throat> a secular substitute for religion, being the expression of what is uh, most important about human beings, uh, what uh, epitomizes the activity of hum human beings at our best. Uh, in, an, in another place, he describes uh, a progression uh, and imagines uh, what rebellious young people looking at the shambles that their culture is uh, could find progressive, uh, hopeful, uh, because expressive of the best of humanity and thinks, well, in the religious culture of the West, uh, there was a moment when Protestantism seemed uh, to promise that sort of liberation within uh, a religious worldview. Uh, and with the Enlightenment, the project of natural science did. Here was a way of throwing off the uh, dead hand of traditional authority by committing oneself to uh, fidelity to the facts. Uh, the purest expression of this was Spinoza's vision of uh, finite human minds as different from one another only insofar as they were imperfect mirrors of nature uh, where the order and connection of our ideas fall short of the order and connection of things insofar as we get things wrong, misrepresent them, uh, the mirrors uh, distorting, insofar as we're ignorant, uh, the mirror is cloudy and is not reflecting uh, what's there. The mind of God is, uh, has exactly the order and connection uh, of its ideas being the order and connection uh, of things. Uh, the mind of God and nature, Deus sive natura, those are two uh, aspects of one thing. But insofar as we commit ourselves to the new project of science, the one that Bacon will be the, uh, another prophet of, we not only, as we improve the accuracy of our representation, not only become more like the mind of God, but become more like each other. The differences between us is just uh, our error and our ignorance about uh, how things are. Well, this could be an inspiring vision. This is common enterprise that uh, natural scientists are engaged in. But Rorty thinks uh, by the middle of the 19th century, anyway, the project of romanticism had advanced far enough that science was displaced as uh, the form of cultural activity that uh, one could use to free oneself from uh, what was wrong with the inherited culture. And that had been taken over by literature, uh, by poetry, but particularly by the rise uh, of the novel. Uh, and it, in Rorty's way of thinking about things, that was a good thing. Uh, and he wonders, you know, as the 20th century draws to the close, what the successor uh, genres are going to be. And this is something that at the very dawn of film and film criticism, uh, Hugo Munsterberg, uh, a member of the Harvard philosophy department in the golden age, who was the first uh, real film critic. Um, uh, if, if you take a film studies course uh, today, you'll probably read some of Munsterberg's uh, writings. 
how he took over, he was an absolute idealist, and took over Hegel's argument that opera was the uh, ultimate art form of its time because it synthesized all of the others. And Munsterberg took this claim over and said, ah, but it's film uh, now. Uh, people make fun of him because he also argued that it was absolutely essential to film being the most perfect possible expression of the absolute, uh, that it be black and white and that it be silent, uh, that those were essential features of it. Uh, I'll also mention that one of the uh, tiny scandals that Bruce Kuklick uh, set off with his history of the Harvard philosophy department, Kuklick uh, we were talking about last week, is uh, photographs in uh, the uh, middle sort of photo section of his book uh, of uh, the portrait of the Harvard philosophy department in uh, 1913 and the portrait as we have it today where Hugo Munsterberg was painted out uh, of it, not airbrushed, just painted out uh, during World War I because he was German and uh, the Harvard philosophy department pretended that he had never, uh, that he had never been there. At any rate, uh, it's in the context of some uh, such progression as that, that Rorty is thinking, uh, there was a cultural function that natural science performed in the Enlightenment that it never lost completely, uh, but, that it, but, but that became displaced. And at the 19th century, in the wake of uh, Romanticism, was when some kind of uh, cultural role that had been exclusively uh, a role of natural science came to be taken over by literature, uh, by uh, the novel. Uh, and he's thinking of textualism as uh, a 20th century form of literary criticism that takes on board Hegel's what he's saying, Hegel's lesson that uh, the Galileo to Newton vocabulary of natural science should be seen as just one vocabulary in which uh, uh, we can think about the culture and uh, ourselves. I mentioned last time that uh, there's a recurring danger that um, recurring temptation that Rorty not infrequently succumbs to of backsliding into merely Carnapian pragmatism. So you know, Carnap had said, look, I am a pragmatist uh, about choice of language, about the meanings that you stipulate. Uh, that's entirely up to you and you should do that based on whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, what, what do you want your, uh, the calculus that you're uh, introducing? What do you want it to do? But once you've done that, uh, he's a descriptivist, he's a representationalist. He says, then the subject matter you're talking about uh, will determine what the actual extensions of these terms that you're using are and will determine what's what's true. Uh, that's the world. But you, as far as picking your language is concerned, picking your meanings, he's completely a pragmatist. You have complete free choice, arbitrium brutum, uh, uh, about that. Um, and that's not the kind of pragmatism that Rorty is uh, championing. His move is to see that, uh, in particular, Quine's criticisms of Carnap uh, from 
based on the idea that uh, there aren't two separable phases of uh, activity in natural language, one that institutes meanings, uh, confers content on concepts, and the other of which then applies them to the world, all there is is talking and making claims. And that has to be intelligible both as making the terms mean what they mean and as determining what's true. Uh, so that's the basis of introducing the vocabulary vocabulary uh, so as not to distinguish between language and theory, meaning and uh, belief. Oh. But then if you do that, you shouldn't say, well, what vocabulary you adopt is completely up to us. Oh. That's uh, making a distinction between what the subject matter or the world we're talking about is authoritative about and what we, the users uh, of uh, the language, are authoritative about. That's the Kantian uh, problematic of uh, assigning responsibility for some features of our discursive practice to the way the world is, saying, oh, that's because of uh, the way the world is, while assigning other features to us. Uh, transcendental idealism says, well, a surprising amount, surprising features of our discursive practice should be uh, understood to be something we're responsible for. Uh, the very fact that uh, we see uh, nature as law governed is not uh, uh, something the way the world is, is responsible for. It's something the way our cognitive faculties are is responsible for. But this vocabulary vocabulary is supposed to undercut that Kantian problematic that mm, distilled down to its purest form leads to the two-stage Carnapian uh, uh, distinction that Quine uh, attacked uh, and makes room for Carnapian pragmatism. Uh, Rorty backslides into a merely Carnapian pragmatism when he talks as though uh, what, what the Romantics discovered is that we're completely free to adopt one vocabulary rather than another, that it's entirely up to us, and therefore that we can remake ourselves by adopting vocabularies to re-describe the world and uh, ourselves in arbitrary ways. Um, he doesn't need to backslide in that way in order to make what I take to be the most important uh, point he's after here, that uh, if we think of one vocabulary as privileged relative to another, so this notion of a privileged vocabulary, his successor conception to the notion of privileged representations from philosophy in the mirror of nature, then we have to ask, uh, does it make sense to say, uh, once we've gotten past the Kantian problematic of assigning probability to us, uh, responsibility to us or to the world for various features of our talk, does it make sense to think about some vocabularies as objectively privileged? Uh, he says in, in 168, uh, the strong textualist is trying to live without metaphysical comfort. He recognizes what Nietzsche and James recognized, that the idea of method presupposes that of a privileged vocabulary, the vocabulary which gets to the essence of the object, the one which expresses the properties which it has in itself, as opposed to those we read into it. Okay, uh, 
I'd like to say something now about uh, this strong textualist claim that's really the um, excuse, the occasion for Rorty's discussion of this. Uh, this is Derrida's Il n'y a pas de hors text. There is nothing outside the text. Um, this is a terrible idea. Uh, and Rorty agrees. Uh, he classifies that formulation as weak textualism. Uh, and uh, and says, the only, this is at 169 and 170, the only force of saying the texts do not refer to non-texts is just the old pragmatist chestnut that any specification of a referent, what's represented, is gonna be in some vocabulary. Thus one is really comparing two descriptions of a thing rather than a description of the thing in itself. These are all merely misleading ways of saying that we shall not see reality plain, unmasked, naked to our gaze. That is that we need to use some vocabulary to talk about the representatives as well as the representings. Textualism has nothing to add to this claim except a new misleading image. The image of the world is consisting of everything written in all the vocabularies used so far. Textualism of that sort adds nothing save an extra metaphor to the romanticism of Hegel and the pragmatism of James and Nietzsche. Okay, so, so Rorty does not endorse this uh, claim. I'd like to drill down a little farther uh, uh, on this point, going beyond uh, what Rorty said about it. Uh, and though, We're not going to worry about this immediate point for a while, a couple of weeks uh, in the course. If you're not tempted at all by this claim of Derrida, that it's sort of text all the way down, uh, that there is nothing outside the text. Uh, remember that the central claim uh, that's bearing the weight in McDowell's mind and world is the claim that the conceptual has no outer boundary. Uh, that what we're thinking about and knowing about is in fully conceptual form every bit as much as our thinking about it is. Uh, if and insofar as this Derridian uh, point uh, is wrong, one shouldn't say that there's nothing outside the text. Uh, one's going to need to understand that in a way that uh, either encompasses McDowell's basic thought in mind and world, or is distinguished from it in some crucial way. And I say this, this issue is going to come up again in the uh, discussion of expressivism, but I, I mention it now in case you think this is a, a straw man that's uh, being put uh, uh, up here. So I want to give some of the background uh, for uh, Derrida's claim. So he's working in a post-structuralist uh, environment. And the, the principal conceptual tool that the structuralists of uh, the 1960s in France uh, used was de Saussure's uh, turn of the century uh, linguistic framework, which understood everything in terms of the relation between signifiers and signifieds. That is, it was a purely representationalist picture uh, 
that understood the significance of uh, signifiers to consist in two things, the relation of the signifier to the signified, of the representing to the represented, uh, and the relation of signifiers one to another. And Derrida says, that framework is wrong. Uh, that representational invocation of the relation to the signified uh, as something orthogonal to the relations among the signifiers, if we really understand structuralism that was getting us to think about the functional roles of these signifiers, we'll see that there's only the signifiers to worry about. Well, this is an extremely unambitious way of rejecting the signifier signified model. Uh, it's to say that model won't work. That's semantically uh, inadequate uh, as a model. Indeed it is, or he would agree, uh, we would agree. Uh, but it's not a very radical rejection of it to, to keep the distinction between signifiers and signifieds and say, well, let's just leave the signifieds out of the picture and think about the relations among the signifiers. That's basically what uh, Derrida is doing in saying, look, it's, it's all the text. Each bit of the text, instead of referring to some thing in a non-textual world, refers to other bits of text that it's interpreting and that interpret it. Now, those of you who are readers of Purse will recognize him saying some similar things about uh, interpretants and uh, interpreters. Uh, and Purse's uh, principal admirer in the next generation, uh, Charles Morris, used this notion of uh, uh, which Peirce had as well as uh, uh, as de Saussure had had at the turn of the, at the beginning of the 20th century, used this notion of the name bearer relation, uh, the relation between a sign and what it signifies. Uh, Morris used this as the basis of what he called semiotics, which is still, uh, I wouldn't say a very healthy tradition, but there's still people working in it, particularly on uh, the literary side and in cultural anthropology. Um, from the point of view of contemporary philosophy of language, uh, this is incredibly primitive. It's pre-Kantian, it's pre-Phrygian, and it's pre-Wittgensteinian. Uh, this is not just representationalism. This is nominalistic representationalism. That is representationalism that takes the relation between a name and its bearer as the paradigm of a representational relation and assimilates all the semantic relations between things and what they represent in a representationalist picture to that Fido, Fido picture. Uh, that's the way Sellers made fun of it. Uh, completely unselfconsciously, I'd mentioned Fodor. Uh, so, oh, well, that's the way horses depend on horses, uh, the way horse representings depend on, uh, on horses. But look, uh, it was one of Kant's great conceptual innovations to is expressed in the claim that the judgment is the smallest unit of experience or of awareness. Uh, that we can only understand names uh, or predicates 
as functions of judgment, that is in terms of the roles they play in the principal discursive activity, which is judging that things are thus and so. Uh, I think the right way to understand that primacy of the propositional in Kant is the judgments are the smallest unit for which we can take responsibility. They're the smallest unit of commitment. Um, but be that as it may, uh, later thinkers, Frege, for instance, sees that what's expressed by sentences is special and prior in the order of explanation to uh, the semantic content of proper names. Uh, he says, because the sentence, the declarative sentence, is the smallest unit to which pragmatic force can attach. Uh, it's the smallest unit you can use in uh, saying something. The later Wittgenstein will, well, even the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus, this is what leads him to prioritize uh, uh, proposition, propositional signs and see a world of facts, not of things. In the later, in the later Wittgenstein, uh, it's the idea that a sentence is the smallest unit in a language game. It's the smallest unit you can use to make a move in the language game, to do something. Uh, there's a huge conceptual split between the pre-Kantian uh, thinking, even representationalist thinking uh, about meaning, which never appreciated what was special about sentences. Uh, before Kant, uh, everybody worked with a bottom up uh, uh, logic and so semantics that started with concepts, particular and general, and then put them together to make, um, to make judgments, classifying one uh, concept under another, and then put them together to make inferences. Kant was the first one to see that uh, in the order of explanation, one needs to start with what you're doing in saying something, in making a judgment, you have to start with judgeable contents. Uh, De Saussure, Peirce, and the semiotic tradition uh, never learned that lesson. They didn't learn that, that lesson of the, of the propositional, the Kant, Frege, Wittgenstein lesson. Uh, De Saussure didn't. Uh, and Derrida didn't. He's still thinking in uh, nominalistic representationalist uh, terms. So I've talked about uh, semantic declarativism before that thinks of all declarative sentences as being in a box. I'm talking now about uh, so semantic declarativism and uh, descriptivism as the view that what you do with declarative sentences is describe or represent how things are. So declarativist descriptivism that uses a descriptive or representational model for uh, what's expressed by declarative sentences or what you're doing and using declarative sentences generally. I'm now talking about nominalistic uh, representationalism that uses the name bearer Fido Fido uh, model as the paradigm representational relation. And the, the Worst possible view, I want to say, is the combination of these in, an, in a view that is uh, representationalist, declarativist, uh, and nominalistic. Uh, so that 
understands everything in terms of represent all meaning in terms of representation, but puts all declarative sentences uh, in the same box as having the same descriptive or representational function, uh, and then uses as the model of representational relations uh, the name bearer relation. Oh, uh, many. Oh, uh, I mean, I said Frege didn't didn't make this distinction. Uh, you know, truth values are not just some objects uh, among others. Uh, for him, uh, Tarski and model theory and uh, possible world semantics do not make this mistake, although they're in a certain sense methodologically nominalist. Uh, they're building up from notions of reference or extension from name bearer relations and the relation between a predicate and its extension. But they treat the semantic interpretants of sentences very differently than they do uh, the semantic interpretants of subsentential components. Uh, the meaning of a sentence is a set of models or a set of possible worlds, not uh, the elements of uh, uh, the model. Uh, the tradition that Derrida is working in is completely innocent of this crucial categorical distinction uh, between nominalistic representations and uh, something that appreciates the, the primacy of the propositional. Uh, so one reason that we should uh, resist uh, Derrida's move is that uh, he's sort of mechanically uh, rejected the letter of the de Saussure nominalism uh, without seeing how radically wrong that way of thinking uh, about things is. So as I say, this is not a, a criticism that Rorty makes, but I, I can't um, uh, let the occasion pass to put this uh, criticism on the table. I latterly added to the already too long list of supplementary readings for, for this week uh, uh, an essay called There's Nothing Outside the Text that's about the Derrida uh, claim. It's not a great essay, but it's not a bad introduction to the way Derrida actually talks about this. And if you're interested uh, in you know, finding out more about that side of it, that's a, um, an accessible way in. But let me pause there for uh, comments or, for comments or questions. Um, I guess about this anti-nominalist, anti-semantic nominalist rant. Well, there's more of a connection than you might think between this and the issue of um, vocabulary relativity uh, and the notion of objectivity, the objectivity of the second essay, the solidarity and objectivity, but the representational uh, realism of uh, the first there's more of a connection between this complaint about nominalism uh, and that uh, and the challenge to various notions of objectivity in terms of uh, vocabulary relativity than you would think. Because one question we can ask is to what extent the categorical structure of the world is a vocabulary relative phenomenon. And the best way into that topic that I know is to ask how we're to address 
a debate between two ways of thinking about the objective world that we are talking about. Uh, is it, as Wittgenstein claims in the Tractatus, to be understood as a world of facts? Or is it to be understood as the reistic tradition, I'm thinking Kodherbinsky's uh, term here, him as a paradigm, or is it to be thought of as a world of objects, of things? Uh, Rorty thinks that if you say it's a world of objects, uh, you've conceded uh, his pragmatist anti-representationalist point uh, because it's clear to him that the notion of fact is vocabulary relative. Uh, it's not an accidental feature, but an essential feature of facts that you can state them. Uh, as Frege says, a fact is a claim that is true. Well, a fact is a thought that is true, uh, Frege says, meaning by thought, a thinkable, not a thinking of it. Uh, but for Frege, uh, facts and true claimables, facts are not what make claimables true, they're what make claimings true. Uh, and Rorty can observe that uh, with every, at least descriptive vocabulary, there comes a range of facts. The physical facts are the facts statable in the vocabulary of physics. Uh, the culinary facts are the facts statable in the language of cooking. The nautical facts are the facts statable in the language of uh, sailing in maritime language. Theological facts are statable in uh, theological vocabulary and so on. So if you take it that the world is everything that is the case, the world that we're talking about is a world of facts, we're just gonna ask, well, what vocabulary are those facts stated in or statable in? And at this point, it looks as though you've got two alternatives to say on the one hand, there's something like nature's own vocabulary, which maybe is the vocabulary of fundamental physics, or to say that notion of nature's own vocabulary, of a vocabulary that is uniquely privileged relative to other vocabularies in that it cuts nature at the joints. It lets us state the facts that make up the world. Oh, uh, oh, uh, e either you say that there is some such uh, notion of a privileged uh, vocabulary, or you say all descriptive vocabularies are on a par. That's what the Rorthian pragmatist says, ontologically on a, on a par. Uh, each of them is causally in contact with the world. It's used in the world, but none of them is semantically or normatively privileged uh, in virtue of its relation to the world. Uh, maybe one of the most extreme versions of this is uh, Quine's friend and colleague, Nelson Goodman, uh, ways of world making, saying, well, actually, with respect to any, any descriptive vocabulary, there's a world, uh, the world of the facts statable in that vocabulary. And we shouldn't think of there just being the world. The notion of the world itself is vocabulary relative. Oh, okay. Now you might think that you could 
avoid that by uh, being a world of things rather than a world of facts person. But in fact, objects are just as vocabulary uh, relative as facts are. Uh, when we talk about objects or things, uh, remember that you can't count objects. Uh, object doesn't come with apparatus to identify and individuate objects. Uh, you can, you need a sortal to do that. The uh, locus classicus for this argument is Frege's Grundlagen. Uh, but he points out that if I just give you this thing and ask how many, you can say, well, it's one deck of cards. It's 52 cards. It's four suits. Uh, it's 13 kinds of uh, cards. Until you give me the sortal and ask me, well, which, which thing do you want me to count? Which kind of thing? Is it cards or decks or suits or colors? Uh, there is no answer to it. You can't say how many things are on this desk, uh, how many pens, how many pieces of paper, yes. Uh, to be able to count things, even to get the sort of domain of quantification that in Quine's version of Tarskian semantics you use, you still need to be able to pick out the elements of the domain you have to do that in some expressively more powerful semantic meta vocabulary, which Quine in his discussion suppresses, but you have to because you need sortals in order to identify and individuate and so be able to count uh, the elements of uh, the domain. Uh, For those of you who haven't read uh, John Etchemendy's book, The Concept of Logical Consequence, what I'm going to say isn't going to make any difference, but uh, he there strenuously objects to running together the notion of mathematical Tarskian models and the notion of possible worlds. Uh, and at the root of his criticism is that um, uh, is this question of where the sortals, where the sortals come from uh, that you use to, on the one hand, specify a possible world, uh, supposed to be a, a more concrete thing, and on the other hand, a tar, skin, uh, a tar skin model. But the long and the short of it is, when you think about uh, the need to invoke sortal concepts in order to identify things, you see that moving from a world of facts picture to a world of objects picture doesn't uh, uh, soften the blow of, uh, doesn't make it easier to respond to the issue of vocabulary relativity of, you know, the very things that you're talking about. So, uh, you know, sophisticated metaphysicians like David Lewis uh, are perfectly aware of this and say, well, look, by a possible world, you know, there, of course there's a privileged vocabulary. It's the vocabulary of ultimate fundamental physics. I assume that it's going to have some way of identifying and individuating ultimate particles. And by a, a possible world, I mean, by possible worlds, I mean all the myriological sums of all the uh, subatomic particles specified in the language of physics and their physical arrangements uh, of them. As he says, physics is going to give us nature's own vocabulary, and that's what we should do uh, with metaphysics. Rorty's question is whether that notion makes sense uh, once one has adopted the vocabulary vocabulary, and so, I mean, there's a lot in that, so, and so gotten beyond the Kantian problematic of assigning responsibility for features of our talk to what we're talking about or to us. Okay. Uh, yes, Ken. 
uh, sorry, can I ask a question which is uh, related to the last topic before the break? Um, uh -huh. um, from my very naive and probably um, um, infested view, I would, I would have a problem with um, the claim that um, every descriptive vocabulary um, um, is ontologically on a par in the sense that it posits the same kinds of entities. Because, um, for example, when I'm using a literature, a literary vocabulary, I'm talking about fictional people. When I'm using um, a mathematical vocabulary, I'm, I'm talking about numbers. When I'm using a scientific vocabulary, I'm using about forces, for example. And um, these would have different, at least different, um, um, uh, uh, Eigenschaften, um, um, uh, kind, kinds of things that yeah, sure. that are possibly yeah. Goodman is happy to say yeah, and each one of them is a world, uh, and they're just very different, very different kinds of worlds. Oh, uh, I mean, I want to introduce some conceptual machinery to think about just this, uh, just this topic. Oh, uh, just for fun, I passed around the first half of a um, of a meme i don't know whether you uh, got this that i saw of somebody taking um, rorty's uh, attitude towards analytic philosophy and let me now uh, send you the second uh, the second half of this uh, thing I, I i didn't do this and so i don't answer for the uh, labeling there, but I thought having both of those, uh, this is sort of uh, a, a serious question as to how you think, uh, what you think Rorty's attitude actually is here. Anyway, that's just uh, uh, a little bit of amusement. Um, if we're thinking about, so, so the last thing I was talking about was, uh, a possibly the most radical sort of vocabulary dependence that one could think about if one thought that the very categorical structure of the objective world uh, was vocabulary relative. That is the question of whether it consisted of facts rather than things. Uh, this is something that Kant Oh, oh, has one of his largest oh, uh, and most controversial commitments uh, addressing. That is, we can think of the world as categorically having objects with their properties and the relations they stand in, the facts that the objects have those properties and stand in those relations. And we can think about the laws uh, that relate uh, those facts and uh, individuate the properties. If we're, for instance, Armstrongian, then what makes something a property that, that it is, is the laws that uh, articulate it. And Kant's saying, ah, but at least those laws, uh, they're not a feature of the world we're talking about. They're something like a projection of our cognitive capacities. Uh, that's uh, pushing a kind of vocabulary relevant relativity uh, all the way down to the most basic categories that we think of the world as coming in. And uh, we, we can ask, you know, anytime there's an issue of independence, one should ask just what kind of dependence is being uh, asserted. Uh, there are many ways in which uh, one thing might be dependent uh, upon another. Uh, and we can ask in particular whether the relation between vocabularies and what, if anything, the vocabularies are about, the kind of vocabulary dependence that's an issue between objectivists, realists, or representationalists on the one hand, and Rorty pragmatists on the other, is that a dependence in the order of being or in the order of understanding? Now, 
we shouldn't take for granted that we know what that traditional distinction comes to. Uh, but you know, when Derrida says uh, there is nothing outside the text, il n'y a pas, that seems like an existential claim, a, a claim about what there is in the order of being, not just a claim about something in the order of understanding. Um, <clears throat> as I say, let's just use that uh, distinction as a stand-in for a moment. Uh, well, how can we distinguish those? Well, ask the counterfactual question. Does it follow from the claim Derrida makes? Uh, does he take it to follow? Does he take it that he's committed by that claim to the counterfactual? That if there were no text or there had been no text, then there would be nothing or would have been nothing. Mm. Is that the sense of there being nothing else, nothing uh, or text? Because at least that counterfactual seems straightforwardly false. After all, you know, before there were humans, there wasn't any language, there wasn't any text. And it's not as though the antecedent of that subjunctive, if there had been no text, is inconceivable. I mean, we think can think about the time before there were humans. Uh, think about that great triumph of the human intellect that is the inferences we can make about what happened in, in some detail in the third, first three minutes uh, of the universe. Uh, there's a danger here of a mistake that uh, that that old modal logician Abraham Lincoln warned us about. Uh, Lincoln, one of his jokes was, he asked, if we were all to agree to call the tail a leg, how many legs would horses have? And the answer he said was four, because you can't change how many legs a horse has by deciding to talk differently. Uh, and I think the answer he gave is correct. That is, when you uh, specify subjunctive or counterfactual circumstances, you do it in the language you use. Uh, thinking about counterfactuals in which you use different languages, apply different vocabularies, still have to be done in some use language. Uh, now, I imagine some of you are thinking, ah, but this is just what two-dimensional modal logic uh, uh, lets us do, is talk about these other uh, counterfactuals. Well, two-dimensional two modal logic is a, a fine formalism, but uh, I think it has... fatal conceptual flaws when used in the philosophy of mind in the way that Jackson and Chalmers uh, want to do. I'm just going to put that uh, to one side. Rorty uh, injudiciously commits himself not a, in these writings, uh, but, but I discussed this in the Rorty on vocabularies, uh, things that were on the reading for this week, uh, to arguing that uh, before there were no, before there were vocabularies, there were no sentences, uh, and therefore no sentences that were true, and therefore no facts. So there weren't any facts before there was language. And endorses in this way uh, an equally injudicious claim that uh, Heidegger makes in Being in Time uh, that before Newton, there was no such thing as gravity. Um, and this is mistaking 
thinkings for thinkables, and running those together. Facts are true thinkables, and there were facts before there were any thinkings of those uh, thinkables. But let me drill down a little more on this point. Uh, we ought to distinguish between reference dependence and sense dependence using Frege's sense reference distinction. So here's an example. Uh, suppose I define a response dependent property. That is a response dependent property is one that something has that's defined in terms of dispositions of something else to respond in a certain way to it. So you might say that being funny is a response dependent property in that to be funny just is to be the sort of thing that makes people laugh such that someone, well, at least someone with a sense of humor uh, is disposed to laugh at. That's what being funny is. Or imagine that I define a, a made up property, call it beautiful star. Uh, the star is because I'm not claiming this is what beautiful means. Uh, and say that something is beautiful just in case uh, uh, a human observer would derive pleasure from looking at it, uh, just in case it's disposed to produce pleasure in human observers. And now ask, oh, uh, were sunsets beautiful before there were people? And the answer is, well, sure they were. Uh, because if there had been a human observer there, she would have derived pleasure from the sunset. Uh, the response dependent property is uh, subjunctively defined. Uh, and even in the case where there were no observers, it's still true that if there were an observer there, they would derive pleasure uh, from it. This is, maybe you can see an application of the Abraham Lincoln point. Uh, even though the property is defined by reference to uh, observers, uh, it doesn't follow that something can't have the property if the observers aren't there. Something can be beautiful in the absence of any observer, because if an observer were there, they would respond in this way. Response dependent properties are sense dependent on the response in that you can't understand what a beautiful star, what beauty, beauty star is, unless you understand what human pleasure is. You can't understand what funny means unless you understand laughing. But it doesn't mean that something can't be funny that nobody laughed at, or that something can't be beautiful star if there's no observer there, because it's defined in terms of what would happen if. So when we think about the, I mean, is, is that distinction uh, clear enough? I say the definition of um, beauty star depends on pleasure. You can't understand what beauty star is unless you understand what pleasure is. You can't understand funny unless you understand laughing. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, something can't have the one property, uh, can't be beautiful if there isn't some pleasure produced by it. Uh, well now, uh, if we think about that categorical question about the vocabulary dependence of a world of facts or a world of objects on a vocabulary in which they're 
uh, specified, it's clear that you can't understand the notion of a fact on the side of the world without understanding the notion of a declarative sentence on the side of the vocabulary. And you can't understand the concept of an object without understanding the concept of a singular term and indeed a sort. You can't understand the concept or the meaning of the term property or relation without understanding what you're doing in predicating, in using verbs. You can't understand the concept of a law without understanding modally qualified, quantified conditionals. All A's are necessarily B's. There's a sense dependent dependence relation between the concepts that we use to articulate the categorical structure of the world and concepts that we use to describe various features of vocabularies in use. These grammatical categories of sentences, of conditionals, of modal operators, of singular terms and predicates. To, to assert that sense dependence of those categorical features on grammatical, pragmatic, semantic features of our uh, discursive practices, of our vocabularies in use, is not to assert a reference dependence. It's not to say that if no one had ever spoken a language, if there had never been language using creatures, and so had never been any declarative sentences, any modal operators, any conditionals, any singular terms, that there wouldn't have been facts and objects uh, and laws relating them. Uh, the sense dependence claim does not entail the reference dependence uh, claim. Any more than uh, the sense dependence of beauty star on pleasure in an observer means that you can't have something with the property of being beautiful star unless there's an observer feeling pleasure. Uh, sense dependence claims don't in general entail the corresponding reference dependence claims. Sad. Okay. So, uh, so when somebody's making a vocabulary dependence claim, for instance, when Kant is telling us that uh, the lawfulness of the relation between two properties uh, is dependent on uh, features of our cognitive faculties. It makes a huge difference whether we understand him as making a reference dependence claim or a sense dependence claim. If he's saying, you can't understand what you're saying when you say that all A's are necessarily B's, without understanding what you're doing when you make a certain kind of inference, without understanding what it is for you to follow a certain rule of inferring uh, the presence of B from the presence of A, without thinking about that cognitive activity of yours, what you're doing when you're doing that, you can't understand the lawfulness that you're taking the world to have. If that's a claim about understanding, about the sense dependence, it doesn't entail a reference dependence claim. So when we think about uh, this fundamental discovery of Kant's, that besides concepts whose defining expressive function it is to describe and explain empirical goings on, ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, 
In addition to that, there are categorial concepts whose expressive, defining expressive role it is to make explicit features of the framework that makes describing and explaining possible. I shall call them categories, he says. Categorial. When he says that, uh, that's, uh, that underwrites sense dependence claims about uh, what's required to understand saying that the world is a world of facts. The world has objects in it. The objects are related to one another. They stand in lawful relations. You can't understand that, Kant is saying, without thinking about what you're doing in making inferences, in referring, in predicating, in claiming, in judging. Uh, but it doesn't follow that if nobody had ever been able to do any of those things, that uh, there wouldn't have been lawful relations among facts and properties. That kind of idealism, reference dependence idealism, that's way different from sense dependence, uh, which is what was special about transcendental uh, idealism. So when we uh, try and think through with Rorty, what are the consequences of taking on board Quine's uh, undercutting of Carnap's uh, language theory distinction uh, and adopt the vocabulary vocabulary? and just talk about vocabularies in use. Uh, and now ask, uh, well, what should we say about the vocabulary dependence of various features of uh, our world? It makes a big difference whether we're asking about the sense dependence of those features or the reference dependence of them. Derrida is not making this distinction and Rorty is not explicitly making this distinction. And there's a danger that uh, claims that are plausible uh, if they're sense dependence claims will be justified sorry, as sense dependence claims but then we'll draw the consequences from them that are appropriate if they were reference dependence claims. At any rate, whenever we want to make a vocabulary dependence claim, we had better be clear about which kind of dependence we're talking about. And just to circle back uh, to uh, an observation I made uh, uh, near the beginning, that if you think that Derrida's, there is nothing outside the text, claim is a crazy claim, because you're thinking of it as, uh, well, anyway, if, if you think that's a crazy claim, take pause uh, when you're reminded that of McDowell's claim that there's nothing, uh, there's, that the conceptual has no outer boundary. Um, we're now in a position to say, well, what would make you dig your heels in about the Derridian textualist claim, putting aside the criticisms of it as nominalists that I was making uh, before is that you're thinking of it as a reference dependence claim. And that's just crazy. There's stuff that isn't text. Of course there is, and there would be that stuff even if there weren't texts and there didn't used to be texts and there still was uh, stuff. That's a crazy idealist claim. McDowell's claim, I'll tell you for free, it's a sense dependence claim. Again, he doesn't put it that way, uh, but uh, 
it, it's a claim of the order of my claim that to understand what you're saying when you say that the world is lawful, you have to understand what you're doing when you make subjunctively robust inferences. To understand what you're saying when you say there are objects, you have to understand what you're doing when you're referring, predicating, and to say that something is a fact, to understand what you're saying, you have to understand what you're doing when you're judging. And this was Kant's insight that then gets radicalized uh, by Hegel. So I'm suggesting that uh, this uh, conceptual distinction between sense dependence and reference dependence, which we can, I think, make very clearly in the case of things like response dependent properties, we can see how these could come apart. Sense dependence, it's talking about a dependence between understanding one vocabulary and understanding another vocabulary. Reference dependence is talking about whether what you say in the one vocabulary can be true without something corresponding in the other vocabulary being true. A very different kind of claim. So this is a, a, a fairly straightforward uh, distinction, uh, but it obviously makes all the difference when we try and think through rigorously what the consequences are of following Rorty in adopting the vocabulary vocabulary, this post-Quinean uh, vocabulary. Uh, the, the first thing we should be careful of is uh, to keep separate sets of books on sense dependence claims and reference dependence claims. Let me pause there for comments or thoughts or questions. So um, what you say that only the sense, uh, sense dependence claim are holistic and the reference dependence claim are not, or? <clears throat> well, that's a good question. How uh, the way I explicated sense dependence, or at least one of the ways I did, is to say, oh, uh, it's a dependence of grasp of what's expressed in one vocabulary on grasp of what's expressed in another vocabulary. So we have the vocabulary of facts about objects and their properties and relations and the laws governing them, which is the vocabulary we use to talk about the most general categorical features of the world that we're making claims about. But that's still, that's an ontological vocabulary. And then there's uh, claims made in a vocabulary that includes expressions like claiming and asserting, uh, referring, predicating, inferring. Uh, and the claim is that uh, there's a, a sense dependence between those. You can't understand the use of the one vocabulary, the ontological vocabulary, without understanding the pragmatic semantic vocabulary, the one we use to talk about what we're doing in talking. I mean, I actually think in that case, there's a reciprocal sense dependence. That is that you can't understand claiming, judging, without understanding the notion of a fact uh, either. That to understand the notion of a singular term and to understand the notion of an object, those are really two sides of one coin. Uh, well, I take it we're going to be holists about both of those, about the meanings of both of those vocabularies, uh, both the ones that are uh, 
describing the objective world and the ones describing our activity. But what I, I take one of the insights of the German idealist tradition to be this claim that you can't understand what you're saying or thinking about the objective world uh, independently of uh, understanding claims about your discursive activity, about what you're doing in uh, using a, a vocabulary. So that this is uh, a sort of master distinction, the sense reference distinction. I mean, obviously it's at the center of uh, uh, Phrygian semantics, the distinction between sense and reference, but now this notion of uh, the different kinds of dependence, and in particular, the dependence of um, uh, the language we use to specify the world we're describing, representing, or talking about, on the one hand, and vocabulary that we use to, well, express maybe it's describing and representing anyway, to, uh, to talk about what we're doing in uh, judging, in referring, in predicating, in inferring, uh, and so on. Other things anybody wants to say about this? Okay. Here's another thing that, so, so I'm suggesting that as conceptual apparatus for uh, us to try and get clearer maybe than Rorty himself was about just what follows from adopting the vocabulary vocabulary. If you think about that, the catechism, the um, uh, at the very on the very last page of the handout, you know those are the sorts of issues that I'm suggesting the sense dependence and reference dependence uh, vocabulary uh, will help us with, and I want to come back and say something about that um, in just a couple minutes. Uh, first, uh, there's another point I'd like to make that uh, also invokes something where he doesn't say, but that I think is helpful for thinking critically about what he does say. So in the second essay, The Solidarity or Objectivity, this on page 174, uh, in the final sentence of his book, Putnam says that the very fact we speak of our different conceptions as different conceptions of rationality posits a Grenzbegriff a limiting concept, a limiting, limiting, I'd say, rather than limited concept of ideal truth. But what is such a posit supposed to do, except to say that from, a God, from God's point of view, the human ra race is heading in the right direction? That is, what kind of privileging of the vocabularies is it that Putnam uh, is invoking? To say that we think we're headed in the right direction is still Rorty, is just to say with Kuhn that we can, by hindsight, tell the story of the past as a story of progress. To say that we still have a long way to go, that our present views should not be cast in bronze, is too platitudinous to require support by positing limit concepts. So it's hard to see what difference is made by the difference between saying there is only dialogue and saying there's also that to which the dialogue converges. So, uh, Putnam has this uh, Persian limit to which um, our dialogue is evolving. And here, Rorty is raising a, a point that I think matters a lot to him, even though in this essay he's not uh, uh, emphasizing it. And that is the claim that we can only tell progress. So that one vocabulary is an improvement on another retrospectively from within our current vocabulary. Uh, it's, a, it's a vocabulary relative assessment. 
Uh, we can't see the world naked. We can't uh, describe it in nature's own vocabulary. If we're talking about privileging of vocabularies and saying this one was better than this other, we're always doing that from some point of view retrospectively uh, uh, from the point of view of a Whiggish retrospective story that says, look, some of the developments of the vocabulary uh, were progressive and others were regressive. By what standard? Well, by the standards of where we are now. Uh, think about the way uh, sort of flat-footed histories of science uh, get written and we say, well, this guy made this mistake and then we discovered this and uh, this is all from the point of view of where we are now. But Rody's thought here is, look, it's pretty cheap to tell a progressive retrospective story. You know, you just use your current standards to uh, sort things into the ones that were getting closer to where we are now and the ones that were farther away. Uh, we could imagine the institutions of natural science being taken over either all at once or gradually by religious fanatics who start using uh, standards of assessment of comparison of theories that include uh, how pleasing to God this uh, theory is or uh, how uh, close the structure of the theory is to the one that the sacred book says uh, is the form of the truth. Uh, and they're going to be able to make retrospective assessments uh, just as well as we do in the history of science now and say, look, uh, we benightedly used to believe in these electrons, uh, but when we realized that was not pleasing to God, we came to tell this different story and, you know, good on us and uh, aren't we happy that we've improved here? Uh, so, you know, we can hope that that won't happen and from where we actually are, we look at that and say, oh, that would be terrible, they'd have a much uh, worse story about the world, but uh, the history is written by the winners uh, in these conceptual developments uh, as well as uh, politically, and it becomes a criterion of adequacy of uh, pitching your change in vocabulary that you tell one of these retrospective stories about how it's an improvement on the previous previous uh, stories. But in Kuhnian fashion, you don't have to persuade the old guys. You just have to get the young ones coming up to accept it. Uh, and then they'll use the new standards, the standards of the new vocabulary to assess whether it was progressive or not. There's nothing outside the dialogue. That's uh, uh, Rorty's point here. And I want to suggest that even by his pragmatist scruples and in a completely non-representationalist way, there's more resources than he's thinking of here. That there is the possibility of uh, sorting these retrospective stories uh, according to prospective standards. Uh, the crude thought is, well, uh, the new scientific theories, we could judge, they better at least be able to keep the old machinery running. Right? They, better, they better not be throwing away technology unless it's technology that can do, do something we could do before better than we could do it before. Well, now we say, well, what, what is better? Oh, uh, that's retrospectively determined. And they say, yes, you know, we were heating our houses well before, but we were also incurring the wrath of God. You know, we're doing it better now because even though in sort of low terms, we aren't as warm still, you know, we're, we're not angering God in the same way. No, there's a kind of prospective uh, assessment. If you think about uh, trying to persuade Aristotle that 
uh, our natural science is better than his, he would not be impressed that we can measure the mass of an electron to the six or seven decimal places that we can, because electrons are nothing to him. But he would be impressed that we can blow really large holes in the ground, that we can move large things fast from one part of the world to another. Uh, mostly he would be impressed by our medicine. Oh, this would be a prospective assessment that is prospective in the sense that somebody earlier in the tradition can assess whether we're better at doing something by their lights than they were. Uh, and this has been hugely important in uh, the history of thought. Uh, when the Arabs conquered uh, the world in the seventh and eighth centuries, uh, why did they care about Greek learning? Uh, yeah, the Greeks told all these stories, but the stories weren't in their sacred books. But Greek physicians could save people from battlefield wounds that the Arab warriors knew were fatal otherwise. And when you ask them, how do you do this thing that's really important to us by our standards, save people from wounds that otherwise were fatal, they started talking about, well, you have to understand that the microcosm and the macrocosm and so on, it was all stuff that you couldn't understand, but the claim was to have the medicine, you've got to have all of this. And so they said, well, all right, there must be something in those books for us and save the libraries so we even have Aristotle um, uh, because of this. In general, there's a sense of technology in which technological progress is exactly what is accessible prospectively. That is by people earlier can say, well, by my standards, here's a thing I care about doing and I can assess how well you do it. And by my standards, you can do it. You later people can do it better then we can do it. There's a lot of stuff that isn't like that. But uh, if you hold as a, a criterion of adequacy of what you're going to retrospectively count as progressive, that they can keep the machines running in this sense, that they uh, continue cumulative technological progress in this sense of technological, in the sense that uh, uh, is exclusively prospectively accessible, you can at least distinguish traditions that are, in that sense, technologically progressive from ones that aren't. Now, it may be that some of your traditions, your poetic traditions, for instance, it may be that you don't care about uh, preserving prospective, uh, prospectively accessible progress. But as long as it's a criterion of adequacy of your theories of the empirical world being scientific, that they are technologically cumulative in this way, as long as the prospective assessments of better and worse uh, at doing something that the earlier people can assess perfectly well, as long as that's a constraint on your retrospective uh, tellings, uh, we can distinguish better or worse vocabularies in this technologically cumulative sense without talking about more accurately representing the way things are. I haven't used representational vocabulary. This is a, pra uh, a pragmatist friendly uh, terminology that I'm using, vocabulary that I'm using to describe uh, a way in which the fact that it comes cheap to, to retrospectively assess and congratulate ourselves on uh, having overcome the pitiable uh, uh, limitations on our ancestors, the fact that uh, 
those sort of self-congratulatory retrospective stories are a dime a dozen, uh, doesn't mean that that's all there is for a pragmatist to uh, appeal to. Uh, so, I mean, this is not what uh, Putnam was invoking and Rorty does not uh, uh, ever address this, uh, as I say, I think uh, entirely pr pragmatist acceptable uh, account of a way in which one can uh, get some control over, apart from just our current, what our current vocabulary permits uh, and distinguish progressive from regressive traditions along this practically important uh, dimension. Remember I talked last time uh, about Purse's pragmatism and are moving not just from images of the, from enlightenment images of the mirror to romantic images of the lamp, uh, but to the pragmatist image of uh, understanding as consisting in the flywheel governor, uh, the device, this notion of technological progress as the constraint on uh, theoretical progress and thinking of that as what's prospectively accessible instead of uh, as a constraint on what's retrospectively accessible. This gives us a grip. Uh, it's as if we're not, uh, well, this is a way not to be simply Carnapian pragmatists, uh, but to, to see real friction and differences among the vocabularies in use, uh, again, without thinking of them in represent, without needing to think about them in representationalist terms. Anything anybody wants to say about that? I have a question, Bob. Yeah, Thomas. So um, this sort of perspective thing, so we can say that we've made prog, you know, we can suppose that uh, late 19th century, early 20th century people were interested, scientists were interested in uh, somehow being more precise with predictions of the motions of, of things, right? Um, and we can look from, from their perspective, if, if that's the, the standard, then we seem to have uh, progressed scientifically. But then when you try to like do steps, you know, all right, let's go to that period and let's go to a period before that. And then you, the, if the standards are different, like you, you kind of get this disjoint story, don't you? Because you'll say like, according to the 17th century people, we made progress in this way. Uh, but according to the 19th century people we made, and it's not gonna be like, a, like the, the typical picture of linear progression, right? It's gonna I, be a much I, more- I think that's just right. That is every one of these, oh, prospectively accessible uh, dimensions of improvement that we could have is going to be its own sort of thread. Yeah. Uh, and it, it may be that the same movement that was progressive along that one was retrogressive or went with, you know, a theory that was at any rate, no improvement uh, uh, over the other one. And so we'd be looking at these sort of interweaving threads and with some of them, the, the progress just stopped. Uh, and we held on to it with some of them, the progress stopped and we didn't care about it anymore. And we, we don't do that, uh, anymore. Uh, still, you know, the Wittgensteinian, uh, picture of the overlapping threads, making a rope, uh, you know, would underwrite generally, or for the most part, assessments of, uh, progress here. Uh, I mean, we do have, I think, uh, gee, our own uh, Ken Manders, uh, one of his really on-point observations about uh, the, about Hilbertian geometry, so axiomatic geometry, that opened up all sorts of understandings about 
traditional geometry that we didn't have. Um, and we lost the capacity to do traditional geometry, to, to do Euclidean geometry on diagrams and to, to do the sorts of constructions that were necessary. And his claim was there was a specific kind of geometrical understanding that went with that, uh, the craft wisdom of engaging in the Euclidean geometric practices that got lost when mathematicians stopped doing that because uh, Hilbertian under understanding of geometry was so much more powerful in uh, you know, connecting it to other bits of mathematical practice. Uh, and, and there's a thing where, uh, I don't know, this is how uh, Descartes a as a young man during these three wander years, uh, went around Europe and would come into each town and ask who's, who's the geometer, who, who teaches geometry here? And then having no letters of introduction, no aristocratic connections would persuade them that he was a better geometer than, than they were. Set me a problem and I'll come back in the morning with the answer. And some of them set him famously unsolved problems, problems that had been unsolved since the Greeks. And in at least three cases, he solved those using his new uh, techniques. And they could say, wow, by our standards, you, you really are here. Well, uh, you know, people would have been able to assess how good are you as a, uh, a Euclidean geometer and say, well, you guys can't do this anymore. You, you haven't had the years of practice doing it. That, that's a loss of a kind of, of, a kind of understanding. Uh, so yeah, those, those things happen and we need to be, Ken's outraged by that. We need to be vigilant about uh, uh, these things because it is a form of understanding. I think that's right. Can, can we also say um, that this would be a kind of progress without being uh, compatible? Um, um, because um, I, I think um, what, what Thomas was referring to, there are uh, some um, there, there are some breaks between um, between theories, uh, but theories um, later theories can be um, accepted as being better than the earlier without being um, compatible or evolving from the earlier theories? Well, certainly. I mean, this is the Kuhnian, uh, uh, where he was a, was a colleague of Kuhn's at Princeton, um, uh, attended some of his classes. This, uh, uh, there are, I was going to say, there, there are stories, to, articles to be written, but I actually think articles have been written uh, about the significance of the structure of scientific revolutions on uh, Rorty's adoption of the vocabulary, vocabulary. Uh, and, and so the sort of incommensurability of vocabularies there was very important, uh, was very important to him. Uh, so yeah, the, there are such uh, uh, divides. Um, let me very quickly say something uh, along these same lines about how, from a pragmatist point of view, one might, after adopting the vocabulary vocabulary and so re rejecting uh, the intelligibility of the content problematic that asks us to assign responsibility for features of our practice to the world and other features to us as an across the board intelligible demand. Still, we can ask, are there resources for a pragmatist to say, yes, but there are some cases in which we can distinguish between features of our practice that are as they are because of the way the world that we're conducting those practices in is as it is, and factors that are as they are because of us. And it seems to me that uh, Rorty hasn't sufficiently asked the, the pragmatist engineering question of how one would think about 
uh, precipitating out of the soup of our practices, practices that were reflective of features uh, of vocabulary transcendent features of the universe, how that might uh, make sense. Uh, and I think Wittgenstein's language games are sometimes designed to highlight what is pragmatically acceptable to us uh, uh, in this case. And one of the things he talks about is counting. So now I'm thinking that we're working within an overarching vocabulary where you know, we know what uh, apples are. We can identify and individuate apples. Um, and that's part of the background of uh, this practice. But it doesn't matter what we use as counting expressions, as long as we've got some expressions with a conventional order. So we can use our numerals or we could use uh, piano uh, stroke notation for successor numerals, or we could use alphabetic expressions. Uh, I think about uh, my favorite, uh, because the most uh, Wittgensteinian uh, comedian, Stephen Wright, asking why the alphabet is in that order. And his conjecture was, uh, it's because the Greeks were actually, uh, had actually visited Australia and heard people saying, Abba uh, well, uh, so, so we have an alphabet and you take the apple from the one bin and put it in the other bin and you say alpha and then beta and then gamma and then delta and so on. How many apples are there? There's delta uh, apples, we say. Now, you do need to have the concept of an apple. Uh, if you just pick the fly from the one to the other, you're not supposed to increment your count. If it's the scrub brush, you're not supposed to. If there were an, an orange in there, well, not if you're counting apples anyway. If you're counting fruit, it's uh, OK. Uh, but now it doesn't matter whether I do that with the Greek alphabet or uh, the English alphabet or the Cyrillic alphabet, or I could use lines in the poem that I, that, that I have memorized. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Well, what doesn't matter? Uh, there's a mapping between the results that I get to uh, in this that uh, even though I'm saying there are delta apples and uh, you're saying that they're D of them and someone else writes the numeral four, uh, those bits, which expressions we apply, that's differing from vocabulary to vocabulary. But the one-to-one -one correspondence between the apples that we moved and the expressions we had, that's a vocabulary independent uh, feature. And, and that feature corresponds to the fact that we're counting apples and the number of apples uh, that we have. Uh, suppose I pick differently colored balls out of a bin offer a description and put them back in the bin. Uh, and then we count not the balls, but the descriptions. So maybe I'm doing this by the color and every time there's a red one, I say red. And what we use our alphabet for is to count the number of times I said red. Uh, well, the descriptions that I'm counting could be by color or by shape. Uh, once again, there's going to be an isomorphism between uh, the number of descriptions as having one property in the one vocabulary and the number in uh, another. And we're going to say, well, all right, 
insofar as we can understand this mapping that would turn your practice into my practice by swapping your noise for my noise at the ground level or in the with replacement case even at a higher level then we can say well those practices are giving us a grip on some feature of the world we're interacting with that swings free of the vocabulary that we're using in order to characterize it and that swings free is just a matter of the mapping from the one vocabulary to another that preserves some property you know how many apples we need for a pie uh, is uh, preserved in that so i mean these are are simple-minded uh, examples but they suggest that we'd be overshooting if we thought that the kind of doubt uh, that adopting the post-Carnap, post-Quine vocabulary vocabulary legitimately casts on the Kantian problematic as a question that's always intelligible we'd be overshooting that if we concluded that it was never intelligible. Uh, it seems like there are features of our practice, even features that we uh, could be uh, become relatively precise about. I'm thinking of what happens when we do measure theory and look at the difference. Uh, Davidson at one place imagines someone where we're, we're weighing things and uh, the, the one person says, well, it weighs one. And the other says, no, it weighs 2.2. So, well, they're disagreeing. Well, no, the one is weighing in kilograms and the other's weighing in pounds. Uh, well, what has to be true about their practices for us to say, no, actually they're, they're both measuring the weight uh, uh, of it, even though they're saying different things about it. And measure theorists can tell us, well, there where we're measuring rather than counting, there has to be a different kind of mapping between uh, what they're doing in order for us to say that they're measuring a quantity of this kind. And I worry that Rorty hasn't uh, worried enough about the sort of ground level pragmatist engineering questions of what features of our practices actually would underwrite assignment of what kinds of features to what's constraining our practices uh, from the outside, as it were, and what uh, is a feature of our practice, the fact that I say it has delta and you say uh, it has D and someone else says it has four, uh, those differences are uh, vocabulary specific and not reflecting something about uh, the world our practices are conducted in. So, I mean, this is a theme I will expatiate on later, but if, if you think of these two examples, the prospective technological uh, way of thinking practically about a notion of project of, of progress that isn't subject, anyway, that, that constrains the uh, promiscuous retrospective justifiability of uh, practices or assessments of uh, progress uh, and this uh, counting and measuring uh, uh, and so on. Uh, it, it's not obvious that there aren't pragmatists uh, resources for reconstructing something. Uh, maybe not, I mean, it won't be everything that uh, Kantor Carnap wanted in the way of um, uh, talking about the world privileging something as doing this better or as, uh, making this right, uh, but uh, maybe enough that we can take on board the pragmatist insights without having to 
I don't know, say th silly things like there's nothing outside the text. Uh, I, I want to have that claim uh, in the cabinet under the heading, how not to be an anti-representationalist. And I've suggested a, a few ways, a few things that are wrong with it. The nominalism, the nominalist semantics, uh, the failure to distinguish sense dependence from reference dependence, uh, and um, but it seems to me that there are prospects for some uh, acceptably pragmatist uh, things to survive the corrosiveness of uh, Rorty's critique. Okay, this week I labeled the things we read uh, Rorty's literary care turn. Uh, it lasted about 10 years. Uh, Rorty said he thought that the figures he wanted to read, people like Hegel and Heidegger and Derrida, were being read in literature departments, not in philosophy departments. And since he thought of philosophy just as a literary genre that reads these mighty dead, uh, he would go talk with those people. Uh, he ended up realizing that now he was an analytic philosopher and those people didn't know how to argue. They didn't know how to make, mis they didn't know how to make distinctions and he basically just couldn't stand uh, talking with them. Um, and made what I think of as a political care uh, uh, instead. And though this had many uh, consequences, uh, theorists of liberal politics will know about his uh, extended interactions with Habermas on the justification of liberal political theory during this time. Uh, but the part I care about is him coming to find a political grounding for his anti-representationalism, uh, political in a very broad, uh, in a very broad sense. Uh, this is pragmatism as anti-authoritarianism. Uh, and this he announced in his Girona lectures, which we start reading for next week. I've labeled that Rorty's political care. Uh, and we'll spend two weeks, one, sort of seeing what kinds of things he said then. Uh, and then the week after that, basically just reading what I make of that uh, in two extended uh, lectures, which will be my Spinoza lectures uh, in Amsterdam uh, next next spring um, and the core of a, uh, of a book. So this is sort of the last uh, time, the, these two weeks are the last two on Rorty. And then we'll look at what Hugh Price makes of all of this and get uh, a, a, a new perspective on all of it. Um, Okay, well then I will uh, see you next week.